and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Ian Scott, and I am the founder of Scott Legal. We are a full-service immigration law firm and provide uh, really every type of immigration service that you can think of. Uh, today, we are going to talk about a very interesting topic, and it's we're going to answer a number of different questions related to non-citizens that are faced with deportation. So in the United States, the term deportation is synonymous with removal. So we move during the uh, presentation, we may use both of those two words interchangeably, but um, but uh, they they are they are really they really do mean the same thing. Just a few housekeeping items. Uh, one of the things that we will or a number of different things we'll send you after the presentation after the webinar. One is we will send you uh, this recording. So this webinar is being recorded. So we will send that to you so that you will have it handy to take a look at. Um, in, in addition, what we will do is we will send you a link where you will be able to set up a consultation with us if you would like to get additional information on any particular topic. Uh, the other housekeeping item is that if you do have any questions, uh, you can either put them in the Q&A box or the chat box. We will get to all questions. We may not answer them uh, you know, right when you list the question, uh, but, uh, but we will get to them before the end. Uh, so without further ado, we uh, you know we are very lucky today to have John Barrera, who is uh, really an expert in this field and has a a, a wealth of immigration knowledge. Um, has been 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 doing this for for many 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 years, and um, we are going to start out with um, a question for John. And John, um, you know, why would a non-citizen in the United States face deportation? Excellent. Good morning, Ian. Good, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me on today. Um, so yeah, so let's start it off with these questions. And um, so why would why would a non citizen be facing deportation? Well, that could be um, that could come as a result of several <clears throat> scenarios or situations. Um, it's simply going to come because the non citizen violated an immigration law. Um, there are several immigration laws on the books, obviously, some are related to a violation of an immigration status or perhaps um, a violation of even a criminal law. So those are kind of like the, the, the scenarios a non-citizen uh, could face that could place them in removal proceedings. Um, the other situation is a little bit more obvious. I kind of referenced that a second ago. Uh, the non-citizen has no legal status in the United States. So that's a situation where either the non-citizen came in on a visa and then for, for whatever reason the visa um he lost the status could be that the visa expired uh his status in the u.s expired or perhaps he committed a a violation of an immigration law that uh terminated the status um <clears throat> so then um that those are the pretty much the two key situations you violate and, and, the, and, the, and they're related to each other where you violate an immigration law and um, that could lead into a uh, ex uh, termination of st status or a loss of status, and that'll probably expose you to um, to to a removal proceeding. Perfect. No, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, and and how does it all occur? Like, so how? Like, if if uh, you know, how, how is someone when someone, is, you know, when the government wants to deport someone uh, or the government wants to put them into uh, pr removal proceedings? How how does that whole process uh, occur? Sure. Um, so essentially, it involves a situation, again, where the non-citizen is exposed to an encounter with an immigration officer or a, an enforcement agent, as they say. USCIS, sorry, the Immigration Service has um, immigration officers who adjudicate affirmative applications. But there's also an inform enforcement side. They're not under USCIS or the U.S. Immigration Service. They're under the Department of Homeland Security. So those are the enforcement officers. Those are the officers you can encounter at a border checkpoint, or they could be the officers within the U.S. that um, are tasked to look for non-citizens who have violated an immigration law. So you have an, a, some sort of situation which involves a government agent encounter. That could be where um, the non-citizen is um, applying for admission to the U.S. at a border checkpoint. That, that could be as, as simple as coming in on a visa and the officer is inspecting the non-citizen and the, and the officer notices something 
something amiss, uh, a past immigration issue, a past criminal issue that opens up the door to detain the, the non-citizen and perhaps put him into the removal proceeding. Um, as briefly mentioned uh, a second ago, applying to the immigration service for, for a benefit. You're applying to USCIS um, for a green card, a change of status, something. And again, there's something, remember again, a violation of an immigration law in the past that triggers the, the adjudicating officer to refer the case to an enforcement agent uh, during the processing of the application. So um, most often that'll be seen if um, the benefit being applied for requires an interview. And at the interview, the officer uh, flags the case for enforcement and enforcement could come and visit him at the interview as well. Um, sometimes, not as often, um, if there is no interview, an enforcement agent can be um, noticed by an immigration officer uh, adjudicating a, a benefit, and the officer could go and, uh, and visit the, the non-citizen and detain them perhaps at his uh, place of business, work, or home um, if, if the past violation was egregious enough. Uh, finally, um, criminal proceedings. So the non-citizen uh, uh, committed some sort of criminal act that exposes him to removal under the immigration laws. And the, the officers are monitoring perhaps the local court systems um, and they, they may have a relationship with local um, law enforcement where if the non-citizen is detained or at a court hearing, it, there is a possibility that, a, that an immigration enforcement officer could go pay him a visit and detain him as well, whether that's at a jail which is probably the more common scenario in some jurisdictions in the U.S. who have a friendly relationship with enforcement, um, perhaps at a court proceeding as well, depending on what the caseload of the enforcement agents are as well. And the priority of um, enforcement against that non-citizen, maybe it's a non-citizen they consider pretty dangerous because of the past acts that he's committed, and they're going to go, um, go look for him to, to protect the community, in other words. Um, and then also, how does it start? Well, once the enforcement officer um, detains the, the non-citizen and flags him as someone who is removable from the United States based on the immigration law, the enforcement officer will commence uh, removal proceedings by issuing what's called a notice to appear, an NTA, and that'll list the allegations against the non-citizen, which are basically his status in the U.S., and essentially will we'll, we'll detail the violation of immigration law and will reference the law that's been violated. And that'll, that's sort of like the, the document that commences this, the, the process in an in a immigration court where you're going to eventually face an immigration judge um, based on the violation of law. Perfect. No, and and in terms of the in terms of um, the 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 an individual, for example, I know you mentioned that that you know sometimes if someone uh, if the government sees someone as a danger to society, they might do, do do more in terms of trying to 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 pursue this person. But but let's say that you know an individual just is um, someone who has has an overstay and doesn't really pose any any risk. What what kind of what kind of chance or, or or how much time is the government going to spend on on a person person like that yeah so you're 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 per, you're perfectly right in your kind of like your impression as far as um the, the issue is what are the resources that enforcement um agency has in enforcing the immigration laws and even though you hear a lot of um you know news media and talk about um, increasing law and immigration enforcement's budgets and everything, um, their, their resources are still pretty limited. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's not easy for them to go after anyone and everyone who's committed an immigration law violation. So historically, what we've seen, you know, whether it was under uh, the, 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 the Obama administration, the Trump administration, the Biden administration, there's always been some level of enforcement priorities. Now, each each administration has described them and given give them different kinds of names. You know, Trump has has been known to be more aggressive, so he he his administration was more focused on trying to communicate that you know everyone's a priority. Whereas Obama and Biden, you know, they've been known to be 
perhaps um, a bit more um, flexible in understanding. So they actually create, okay, these are like the four or five priorities that we're going after. Um, these have the highest priority. These might have some priority. These have the lowest priority, et cetera. So, but when you look at it, it's always some, some kind of level of priority that's going on. And, 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 and I think naturally they, the, the agency needs that in order to do their job effectively. So it's always going to be the highest priority is going to be someone um, who's committed a violent acts in the past, who's a danger to the community. They're always going to be the top of the list, no matter what the administration is going to be. Then <clears throat> the lowest priority are those going to be here for years without status. They've created families here. They've, they have a business. They've been employed for several years. So lower priority because they're not as, as much danger to the community. And then somewhere in the middle, you have individuals who perhaps lost their status. They're not here for very long. They don't have any family. They're kind of like the, the low hanging fruit because um, the, the government has more access to where they are, where they're living and everything. So they're maybe they could be easier to get. But again, that'll be like, what are the politics during that time frame, right? If, if the administration is more aggressive, those individuals will be perhaps more at risk. If the administration is more flexible, those individuals who haven't been here for long, who just violated status, they start to go down in priority significantly and they're gonna focus more on, okay, so maybe not. So these are the individuals that under an administration that's not so aggressive, the violent offenders, like I mentioned before, um, people who are, sorry, non-citizens who are not violent, but they created crimes who could put, it, put the community in danger, driving under the, the influence kind of situations. Um, so those becomes, a, and, and they're always gonna kind of trend towards the top. Danger, 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 more, more priority. Technical violations, especially if they've been here for a long time, start to go down in priority. So that's kind of like where you, see, where you look at and obviously, what are the politics of the day, the administration, that'll influence what those trends are going to be looking like in, in terms of uh, priorities. Perfect. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, that definitely gives us a good kind of summary of the different types of, 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 of offenses and, 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 and the priorities. And, and, you know, the general question of who can be deported? So who, who can be deported and who can't be deported from the United States? Yeah, so, um, any so basically any non sitting non citizen can be exposed to removal, but even non citizens in the U.S. have due process rights. So um, they just can't go after any non citizen who who has status. Like I mentioned before, the first triggering is, issue is did the non citizen non citizen with status create some sort of violation, which starts to open up that that door of possibilities. Obviously a non-citizen who's here without status, they're always exposed to removal. But again, it's not a situation where ICE or Immigration Customs Enforcement can come nab them and you're out the door. Due process does come in. That's why the removal process, the removal proceedings comes into play and they have to go through that process. Perfect. Excellent. That sounds, that sounds, sounds good. Now, you know, what can, you know, someone who is, um, is here like a non-citizen that's in the United States and, um, you know, the government is, is, is trying to, to remove them. What can, what can the non-citizen do? Like how, how can they challenge the, the, the removal? Yeah. So the best advice is always to seek legal counsel because legal counsel will be able to kind of like, um, <clears throat> Uh, evaluate the situation and know best best um, the best course to to defend that removal proceeding. So um, you have essentially two two scenarios. One is a non citizen who was here with status that that um, violated the law that puts status in jeopardy. Those cases um, tend to um, take a more uh, take a track where perhaps the attorney is looking to be more aggressive. Um, and that the reason is because those processes um, look more like a criminal proceeding, where in a criminal proceeding, the government has the burden of proof to prove that, um, that, it, that a, an accused individual is guilty of a charge and they have a high burden of proof beyond the reasonable, reasonable doubt and all that. Um, in a criminal case. In an immigration case where a non-citizen uh, violated a law, 
that puts his status in jeopardy. Similarly, the government has um, a burden. Uh, they have the burden to to prove that the non-citizen did commit a, uh, an immigration law violation, not as high as a criminal case. So this is clear and convincing evidence. But they have to prove to the immigration judge, the government, that this um, this violation occurred. So, you know, the government is not infallible. They don't know everything. You know, they may disagree with me, but <laughs> that that does happen. So in those cases, the, um, an attorney will look at the case and take a look at the elements of the law that was violated and determine whether, you know, did did did, did my client. Uh, meet all these elements to violate that law. And it doesn't always work out that way. So in those cases, the attorney will um, challenge the charge of removability and make an argument, obviously, and the judge will make a call whether um, it's not a jury, right? That's where it deviates from the criminal case. It's going to be a judge, but the judge will will, will determine whether um, a statute and immigration law was violated and determine whether the non-citizen is removable. Where it changes a bit is when you have a non-citizen who's, who doesn't have status, uh, status expired, or uh, you have an individual that came in undocumented from the southern border. Um, those are easier to prove. Um, there are situations where you might be able to challenge those cases um, where it wasn't apparent when the, the non-citizen was detained what his or her status was at the time. Um, not usually the case, but it does happen. And that part of the case does kind of um, um, track a criminal case where um, you have search and seizure laws at play. You, how did the government officer become aware that the non-citizen is, is, is undocumented? Um, and that's not always clear. Um, so sometimes the, that case can be challenged on the basis that um, the government can't meet its bur burden, but it's really because there was a search and seizure violation by the enforcement officer that discovered the, the non-status of the individual through some sort of unlawful means. Now, to caution everybody, very difficult to do in immigration court. Um, the standards um, are very low for the government in search and seizure law compared to a criminal case. Um, so it, it, it doesn't happen very frequently to successfully challenge removability for a non-citizen um, in removal proceedings for not having status. But it does happen, and it's something that an attorney will expo explore, of course. Excellent. No, that's uh, that's great, great information. And and so so if you know if you are if in the situation and um, you know if there's a, the, there's a charge of that you're removable and you can't successfully um, challenge the basis of the removability, are you just deported at that point, or or or, or do you have any other options? Not necessarily. So <clears throat> it's it's kind of a step by step process, right? where the first step is, can you challenge the, the, the charge of removability? So now we're going down the path where it doesn't look like we're gonna be able to challenge or the judge has already decided that your client or the non-citizen is removable from the US. Next step then is, <clears throat> does the non, is, is, it an, is an immigration benefit available for the non-citizen to apply for that will um, stop or stop the, the removal process, um, grant him status and some sort of immigration status that will allow him to stay here in the US. So that's the next step that you're looking at. Um, there's not an unlimited <laughs> unlimited uh, resource of benefits you can apply for as a non-citizen, but there are a few that are worth mentioning. Um, you have situations where a non-citizen fears returning to their country of origin. Um, so perhaps they will uh, qualify for some sort of as asylum related protection. Um, they feel persecution by the government or an entity that the government cannot or will not control. Um, and they have to meet some other requirements as far as the reason for the persecution. But if that's a situation, asylum related protection can be explored and can be applied for. In some cases, it could lead to a green card through that process. Um, another option is the non-citizen um, may, may qualify for a green card. This will typically work with the family-based case. 
So it's usually going to be like a, a situation where, where the non-citizen has a U.S. citizen spouse. Sometimes it could be a U.S. citizen son or daughter over 21 years of age. In some very limited situations, perhaps an old petition filed by a, um, a parent, a legal permanent resident or U.S. citizen parent in the past, um, where the family-based case could qualify him for a green card. Here, the attorney has to look at a few things, though. Um, is the case ready to process for a green card? Because not all cases will be. For instance, um, if it's a sibling petitioning for another sibling, there's a waiting period for many years. So it might not be ready to go. Whereas a U.S. spousal, sorry, a U.S. spouse petitioning for a spouse, those petitions are always ready to go. There's no waiting period. So that starts to open the door for possibilities. Um, can they apply for a green card within the U U.S.? That's not something that is always available. Most often a non-citizen should be applying for a green card from their country of origin. So they have to meet a certain, ex certain exceptions to, to apply for a green card within the US. So if they meet one of those exceptions, that door opens up and that's, that's definitely a possibility to apply for the green card um, before the immigration judge through a family-based petition. Um, another um, option is what they call cancellation of removal. This is sort of like a waiver that may be available to forgive the, um, the, the violation of law. And could, if it's a green card holder that, that committed a, a violation of law, can restore that green card if they meet the requirements. And there's usually, uh, in, in, in whatever version of cancellation of removal, there's usually a certain amount of years that have to be proven. And then perhaps and, and other equities, positive things in the non-citizen's life, perhaps hardship to a family member in order to qualify for, for cancellation. Um, there's cancellation of removal, the version for, not, for non-citizens who have no legal status. Um, very much harder to prove. Here they have to prove 10 years in the U.S. And here they do have to prove a significant hardship to a U.S. citizen parent or a spouse or a child. And it's a very high level of hardship um, it's called exceptional and extremely unusual hardship. Um, but if you can meet those requirements, that case will, we're not talking about restoring the green card. This is a non-citizen without status. It will grant them the green card through that waiver process with the judge. Um, then you have um, non-citizens with status, usually green card holders who created some sort of misrepresentation or fraud that got them in trouble. So there are some waivers that could be available um, that could restore their status as well if they, if they meet certain, uh, it's similar to the cancellation, right? Where they still have to meet certain um, requirements with family members, perhaps hardship, hardship to the, to the non-citizen himself um, to qualify. Um, prosecutorial discretion, that's a, that's a big thing right now with the Biden administration. That's a situation where doesn't look like a benefit's really available or eligibility is really in doubt um, where the government will look at the case. And if the non-citizen, th this goes back to the conversation regarding priorities, where if the non-citizen is a lower priority under that administration's um, kind of list, then the government could perhaps agree to terminate the removal process and let the non-citizen go. Um, it, it doesn't happen as much with someone who has created a violation that's that puts their status in risk, but it's more seen in situations where a non-citizen has no status, but ha is that individual who has lived here for many year, years without breaking the law and has family, th those situations open up to prosecutorial discretion more than any. Uh, unfortunately, though, in most cases, especially under the Biden administration, um, it, it's nice that they're being released and they're and they're allowed to continue on with their lives. But it doesn't always mean that they're left with some sort of benefit that'll stabilize kind of like their employment situation. So it's kind of like the better or nothing option, but it's still not the best option. But sometimes that's all you get uh, because the, your client doesn't qualify for anything else. Uh, finally, acquiring citizenship. So this happens a little bit more than people think, where you have a non-citizen who might actually, might actually be a U.S. citizen, but they don't know it. Um, U.S. citizen, so 
acquisition acquisition of citizen through like birth or after birth <clears throat> is is pretty complicated, especially because the laws have changed um, significantly in I don't know the last like almost hundred years. There are different versions of the law, so it's not always clear whether a non citizen might be a citizen if they have a parent who's a U.S. citizen. That's those are the situations that you're looking at. Um, so one of the things that an attorney should do is find out who are your parents where did they live you know are, are they citizens of the u.s because if an answer is yes with yes i have a parent who's a u.s citizen you start delving into that a little bit more because you, you could be surprised you could find out oh you know what you're a citizen of the united states we could get this terminated you don't have to deal with this anymore just because of that so um doesn't happen all the time but it does happen a little bit more than people think Excellent. No, that sounds great. Now, one question for you, John, with respect to the adjustment of status to a green card. And I know that you had mentioned the, um, you know, one category, which is the uh, U.S. citizen. It's kind of sponsoring uh, the their spouse. And and you also mentioned a sibling category. Now, if the, if the, in the sibling category, like let's say, you know, the the category became current. Um, let's say the sib the sibling that's non citizen um, was was in removal proceedings. Uh, then the category became current. Would the sibling would something else have to be done before they could stay, or or would just be the bill the fact that they're eligible now for the green card be enough so that they would be able to adjust? Um, no, there will be another step to take. So the first thing you're going to look at, like you mentioned, Ian, is is the priority date current. Um, and this will will frequently will frequently see this in situations where um, a petition was filed by the blink before what they call um, um, 245I. There's a law that's called 240 INA. It's under the the immigration law known as the Immigration Nationality Act under two, Section 245I, where the petition was filed um, before 2001, which is a there were actually two sun sunset dates. One was 1998, the other one was 2001, where if the petition was filed before that, that specific sunset date, um, that law is one of the exceptions that I mentioned, that I briefly mentioned before, which will allow the non-citizen to apply for the green card within the US. So when you're dealing with sibling petitions, the ones that are gonna work in the scenario where there's a removal case, are those cases that perhaps qualify under 245 I, mm -hmm. where they hit, they were filed before the sunset date. So if they're able to, to apply for the green card, they could adjust here in the US, they don't have to leave. Um, and so if, you know, since it happened years ago, the priority date is gonna be close to or, at, or, or current by the time they're in removal proceedings when they get caught, right? Okay. So those combination of factors will allow the non-citizen to now apply for the la second part of the case, which is filing the final filing the final application, which is the form I-485, which can be done now in front of the immigration judge. So the immigration judge could take the 485. In some cases, you can convince the government to agree to ask the judge to terminate the proceeding. Proceedings, okay. And then you could file the 485 with USCIS and USCIS will adjudicate at that point. What won't work though, is if the removal proceeding is pending in that situation and you try to file with the 485 with USCIS, USCIS is gonna kick it out and say, no, you gotta take care of the removal here and you need to go back to the judge, file it with the judge and take, let the judge do it or get that case closed with the judge and then you can come back to us and we'll, we'll do it for you. Interesting, no, that's, yeah, because we, we get a lot of, um, some of our, our um you know, we do some E2 visas and we also do a, another green card, which is an EB5 visa. And we do have some some clients call and, uh, you know, that have been here for many, many years without without uh, documents. And they ask, you know, if I invest the $800,000 in this program, can I get the, you know, can I can I get the green card and can I get status? And uh, it's, it's always, unfortunately, m much more complicated <laughs> than a yes. Right? So, so it's, uh, yeah, but. Excellent. No, that sounds great. So, so now let's switch gears a little bit, and you know, just someone is uh, you know walking down the street one day, or they're you know going to uh, you know walking down the street one day, let's say, and they get stopped by a, a law enforcement officer. You, you know, what, what what should they do? Should they you know whether whether it's an immigration agent or or law enforcement officer, what should they do? Should they you know tell them their life story, or what what should they do? 
Yeah, th that's a great question. Um, it, because it, it's it's a bit of a tricky dance when when you're being encountered by a um, a law enforcement officer. Um, you know, usually you're you're typically going to have the mindset where you want to cooperate. You know, you you, you want to allow the officer to do their job and and everything. The problem is that um, you know that mindset could get you in trouble because. Um, the officer, even though he's doing his job, is always probing to see if, if there's been some sort of violation of law. Um, and you have to be, understand that even though they have they have a duty to uphold the law and to do their job, you also have rights or the, any any person in the U.S. has rights um, and, you know, due process rights in order to uh, that allow them to defend themselves. So one of the first stages or one of the ways that, you know, kind of our Constitution and our laws were created to kind of uh, protect those rights, you know, is, is the right to remain silent, you know? So if you're detained by an, off, by an officer, whether it's the police or an immigration officer, you always have that right to remain silent. You don't, you don't have to, you know, answer, answer questions, um, um, you know, under obligation, you know, they, they have to reach, you know, they're, they're, you see that in the t on TV and the, and the movies, if they're going to interrogate you, you know, you know, where, where you're detained, they have to read you your rights, which essentially is the right to remain silent. And at that point, they could they could commence questioning. Um, and then you have that right. You don't have to answer those questions. Now, um, a, most times an officer, you know, now we're delving more into immigration law, you know, will ask you questions that don't seem that harmful, but they are, they could be harmful in, in, in an immigration context. So it the, the question the question that doesn't seem that that problematic but it is is you know where were you born you know it, it, it could be as simple as that do you have to answer that you know no you, you don't really have to answer that you know if anything perhaps identify yourself who you are what your name is but then from there you know you could you could remain silent because if you if you reveal that you weren't born in the u.s the officer could you start to open that door and, and get into that gray gray area as to what else the officer kind of can get out of you without, you know, you, you knowing your rights or, vi or violating uh, your right to remain silent. So it's always better not, you know, understand what the question is being asked of you. If you have any doubt, you have the right to remain silent, ask for an attorney. Um, and then the attorney will kind of like, you know, take care of the, the communication with the officer and go from there. And these are the situations where sometimes um, this can open up to a motion to suppress in that situation in a removal proceeding where a non-citizen without status could defend the case, could actually challenge the case because there's some, some uncertainty as to the lawfulness as to how the immigration officer obtained that information that the non-citizen actually has no status in the U.S. Um, so this this kind of is is related to that situation as well. Excellent. No, it's uh, definitely with uh, Miranda rights. You know, you it's all, all of you uh, who watch television and any any time they they uh, you know law enforcement wants to interact with someone or arrest them they you know the, you have the right to remain silent and what they say next is if you choose not to remain silent mm -hmm. anything you say can and will be used yeah. against you right so it's uh, definitely uh, I, I i hear you i think the best of uh, best route is to say 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 nothing or very little uh so so now you know i imagine there are uh you know like sometimes for example um whether it's either mistakes are made or or it could be that just someone um you know had had some some violation of the law and um they may have a past removal order against them but they're not even aware of it because they the notice to appear was never sent to them it was sent to a wrong address etc but so so how, how do you know if you um are subject to a, a, a removal order yeah, that's a great question. The, the problem with these processes is, is that they're not very clear and they're very confusing to start with. Um, even though they have an enforcement, kind of like a police component, like a immigration customs enforcement, um, and they have a court comp component, which is the immigration court or the immigration judge. Um, it's not always clear for the non-citizen who they're dealing with at what moment, because 
Um, sometimes these enforcement agents look like regular immigration officers at an in administration administrative process, you know. Um, so there, it, it's not clear what are my rights, what are, what's happening here until, you know, obviously the officer shows the badge and, and, and arrests the person or, 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 or just the cuffs because an agent can show a badge as well of some sort. Um, so it's not always clear what's what's going on, especially if it's a non-citizen who doesn't speak English, right? Um, a non-citizen who perhaps has never gone through a legal proceeding before. Um, so, you know, all of this starts to become kind of new. Um, it, it's, it's sort of um, a criminal kind of process because there's a potential arrest, um, but it's, it's really civil in nature. So a lot of cases you're released um, and you're dealing with, like you even mentioned the end, they send the they send the ad the notice to a wrong address. That happens a lot. Why? Because a non citizen, when they're being processed by an agent, will give an address. Um, they'll be reporting to the agent. Perhaps the non citizen moves, changes address, and lets the officer know that he changed address, thinking that the officer will track that address and he'll be fine. But because enforcement isn't directly connected with the courts, even though enforcement has your address, if you don't update the courts, the courts will just have that first address from the initial processing, but they, they won't know the update until, unless you tell them, tell them directly. So that's where that confusion comes in a lot of times with addresses where they'll send the notice to the wrong address because they never got the update. And it's a lot of times because innocently, the non-citizen didn't know or didn't understand. It's really, it's really a situation where they don't understand that they had to notify the court and that could get them in trouble. Um, so that's, that's really the biggest issue with these, with these cases because they're kind of hybrid criminal civil cases in nature. You have communication issues. They're very technical. Um, you're dealing with different, different government agencies. That creates confusion as to what's going on um, if you don't show up to a court hearing, let's say because you never got notice, you get issue, you get hit with an in absentia order, which is a removal order because you didn't show up to court. So that's one way you're going to get hit with it. Um, it could be that you are showing up to court, but, you know, there were no issues with your address. You were showing up, you never moved maybe. Um, but you didn't understand this whole process that of challenging the removal proceeding and perhaps you had a case you could challenge or you didn't understand the benefits that are available because there's no list outside the courtroom that's gonna tell you cancellation of removal, adjustment of status, asylum. There's no way you're gonna know this. What, what happens a lot of, what should be happening is that an immigration judge will go over your case with you if you don't have an attorney and will ask you questions and perhaps, and the judge is supposed to kind of um, probe to see if perhaps you qualify for a benefit and let you know. But sometimes, because there, there are a lot of times highly technical questions, the non-citizen won't know how to answer it. And because the, the judge is trying to get through that docket really quick, we'll come to the conclusion, you don't qualify for anything. So do you want, you, you know, the, another benefit is voluntary departure. May offer, I'll give you 30 days, 90 days, or 120 days to depart on your own volition. And I'll give you a date to depart. Or, you know, you, I don't, I don't think you deserve it, or you know, maybe you have a, not a great criminal history. I'm going to issue a removal order on the spot. Not always clear to the non-citizen what's going on. So, those are different situations where a removal order can um, can issue or can be created, which can also lead to a situation where the non-citizen doesn't understand what's happening. So, the best thing I could tell someone is, did you see an immigration judge? Um, did, were you told that you were going to have an immigration hearing, but you never got a hearing notice? Those are the, those answers to those questions or those questions are meant to elicit answers that could raise those red flags that perhaps there was a removal order, um, in that situation. So, um, it's essentially, did you see an immigration judge? You don't know what happened. There might be a removal order because it just doesn't go away unless Unless you, unless the government offer prosecutorial discretion, but you just don't know. You just don't know. I mean, if, 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 unless you know what you're looking for or you know what, what it sounds like.
So, and even, even if they did with the prosecutorial discretion, that does, that just takes care of the removal, but it doesn't kind of give you a green card or anything, right? It doesn't, you know, doesn't. Right. Or so, could it? well, yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the version of prosecutorial discretion that I was referring to is that situation where um, there's it's not clear whether you qualify for a benefit. And, but you've been living here, you know, you have many equities, many positive things in your life where you warrant that discretion to perhaps have the, the removal proceeding terminated. Um, but prosecutorial discretion could take other forms. Um, for instance, um, you do qualify for a benefit. Let's say you qualify for that 10 year cancellation. You're a non citizen that qualifies for 10 year cancellation. Now, the reason I don't usually bring it up is because it doesn't usually happen very often, but it, but it has happened. But discretion in that case could be that the government acknowledges that you do qualify and you do merit that benefit and they'll let the judge know i'm going to exercise my discretion to give um my recommendation to grant this case okay. um so that could be a version as well where they agree it happens but it, it's very rare usually even even during more let's say we call it immigration friendly administrations um if you're going to go forward with applying for a benefit, usually the government is going to take a, is, is usually going to take an, an aggressive posture to challenge that you do deserve that benefit or you qualify. Okay, perfect. And, and John, one of the questions that came in has to do with, uh, you know, when, when someone is placed in removal. So when they're placed in removal, are they um, detained? Are they put in like an immigration prison or what, what, what happens to people once they're placed in removal? Yeah, so there usually is some form of detention, some ugly, scary form of detention where you are you are arrested. Um, then after that, it, it'll it'll vary, but in most cases, if we're talking about a more immigration friendly administration, if you don't have a really negative uh, criminal history, what'll happen is the officers will process you, you know, take your name, address, in place of employment, do a record check, what's your family and all that. So get, get that background information from you and then they will release you on your own recognizance. So you'll, they'll tell you, this is where sometimes the confusion leads. You're gonna get an, a, a notice hearing. Sometimes they'll give you the, a, a, ver, a copy of the NTA that I mentioned before, and it'll have the court hearing on it. Sometimes it won't, it's supposed to have the court hearing on it. Um, and if it doesn't, they'll let you know that you'll be getting a notice. And even if it has a hearing, the hearing date on the, on the NTA, you should be wary that the court could easily change that, that date. Um, so that's, that's what will likely happen to someone who has, maybe it's a, it's a non-citizen with status that created a technical violation, but not, so it's not a danger, right? Mm -hmm. um, they'll probably face that situation where they're briefly detained uh, within about a day or maybe even, even two, they'll be released on their own recognizance and they just have to be awaiting their court hearing. Okay. Uh, and then you have non-citizens that were probably encountered at a jail or a criminal proceeding where they committed some sort of more dangerous crime. Those non-citizens will, will probably detain uh, for a longer period of time. Sometimes they will never be released and their, their case will track differently if they're not released. If they're detained and the enforcement agent doesn't want to let them go, then they're going to see an immigration judge. They'll be sent to a facility usually um, where um, there's a special docket for non-citizens that are detained. And those judges, would, they'll hear, for instance, motions on bond for release. Um, and they'll, they could, issue, just like a criminal proceeding, they could issue a bond amount so that it's paid and then the non-citizen will, will be released, be placed on the regular docket and go on just like someone who's released on their own recognizance. Or the judge will issue a bond so high that it can't be paid or not issue a bond because they think there's so much of a danger. They'll continue on that detained docket. They won't be released. Granted, the detained docket will usually process faster than the non-detained docket. The non-detained non docket could process for months, maybe even a year, a little bit more than a year. Um, a detained docket is supposed to process within a short few months, maybe four months, something like that, even shorter, to try to complete everything in the case. 
Great. No, thank you. So yeah, we we had one situation um, a, a while ago where we had a, a client who uh, you know had a lot of a lot of issues, some, some criminal issues, some some you know was subject to a removal order, etc. And um, then he was kind of turned his life around and became a contractor. Was going to get this contracting license, and when he got to the um, you know, kind of municipal office. Um, ICE was 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 there waiting for him, and they took him off. Um, you know, took him off, and that's when that's when he came to to us asking, you know, what what can be done. And he was detained, and he was kept there, and there's absolutely no way that they were going to let him out. But but with that, you know, my my question is, so if someone does have a past removal order, <laughs> and um, you know what? What should they avoid doing, or should they? Should they? You know how, how should they live their their you know life in 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 the U.S. Um, what what you know? Any any advice there? Yep. <clears throat> so, I think the first thing I'll say, and it's starting to answer the question, is um, it's easier for someone who is who becomes aware to do this, and and sometimes they're not always aware. That's that's one of the unfortunate things. Sometimes they they just don't know if they have one, and they don't think about it. But if you become aware that you might have a removal order, like I said, oh, my God, I, I saw a judge this one time and I'm not sure what happened with that case, you know, or I was detained and I was given some paperwork and I never had a court hearing after that. OK, so if you're aware of that situation, speak to an immigra immigration attorney, it's an immigration attorney. It, it may take some time. I mean, there are ways we could try and find it um, pretty quick. If your case is in the system, it's not always on the system, um, but there are other avenues. For instance, we could do a Freedom of Information Act to the immigration courts or to the enforcement bodies um, within immigration to see if that removal order exists. And, and essentially, that's that's the key here. Once you become aware of it, that you might have something out there, run to an immigration attorney, you know, explain the situation. And the, the immigration attorney, obviously, if he could if he if he could tell you what's going on right there, right then and there, he'll tell you or she'll tell you. Um, if not, the attorney will tell you, OK, we need to go further. We're going to run your fingerprints. We're going to do a Freedom of Information Act. And that'll reveal to us if you actually have a removal order and go from there. Excellent. No, perfect. Great, great information. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. I took, uh, you know, some of the questions that were being asked during the presentation, I was asking them as we were going going through. So we've covered all the questions uh, as, as as well the people have had. Uh, thank you very much, John. A lot of great information there. And as I said to everyone, what we will do is this, uh, this webinar has been recorded, so we will uh, publish it on our YouTube channel. We do encourage you as well to sign up for our YouTube channel and uh, hit the subscribe button. We regularly post new videos on a number of different immigration topics. And also, as I said, we will send you a link to set up a consultation if you have any additional questions. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, John, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Okay, bye-bye.